Hello, Barcelona. Um, this is Threat Modeling Live. My name is Alex Hutton. I work for Verizon Business. I'm a principal uh, in our, for our risk team. I think that, yeah, this is my PR title, Principal of Risk and Intelligence. Um, I have blogging things that I do. Um, there's obviously the business blog. Uh, I'm part of a blog called the NewSchoolSecurity.com. New School uh, and I'm also a founding member of the Society of Information Risk Analysts. Uh, if you are into the Twitter, I'm at Alex Hutton. <laughs>
So I actually like to I actually like to draw out systems that I work on, and a system in this case could be like a technology system, like a network, or it could be actually the input and output of a product or an organization. But the the difference between say a system a system uh, model and a system map is that a map is kind of fixed. Like you've all seen network diagrams that make you groan because it doesn't really tell you anything about how the components interact or how you would expect traffic to flow or what types of behavior would be allowed and prohibited, would be wanted versus unwanted. So system models are very are different than maps because they include some sort of understanding of what the dynamics of the system are. And the other thing that I think is sort of interesting about using a system-based approach to design here is that where systems get really complex is in the boundaries, where systems interact and interconnect. Um, that is, a, and that is typically where we see a lot of risk as well, right? The, the risk in information security is not usually the connection between two points, it's the actual endpoints themselves that um, are where you get the complexity and then the, uh, the risk. If you think about how a lot of us learned uh, security management, we've learned basically a perimeter defense. You have a system, and maybe you have some folks interconnecting to you, but basically you can draw a boundary or a border around your system, and then you harden it, and you keep the bad stuff out and keep the good stuff in. But none of us work in organizations like that. I mean, none of us work on systems like that. The systems, systems grow and progress and evolve because of their interconnections with other systems. So if you work for a business and the system that you're managing is a business related system, you're going to have users, you're going to have partners, and you're going to have customers all connect to you. That's where you get the value out of your system. Which essentially means that that perimeter that you've been talking about, wrapping your arms around your own system, is extended past, past the limits of your own actual control, right? Because how many of you can really control your end user systems or your customer systems? Um, any, anyone? Because I'd like to know how you can. Um, and, and of course, what we, what we often see happening is that when your, when your system is being attacked, Maybe it's your network, maybe it's your not, but when your system is attacked, don't they come in through those legitimate connections? Of course they do, because that's where the complexity is. That's where your control breaks down. It's not necessarily your, you can't necessarily harden a perimeter of an actual dynamic system. Okay, so now we move into management. So there are some different types of models that are interesting here. Um, and I don't know if any of you are sort of risk and data geeks, but there's a really popular book right now by Douglas Hubbard called Failure Risk Management, and one of his great quotes is that risk management that reacts to yesterday's news is not risk management at all. So, of course, agree to that, sort of shutting the barn door after the cows have left, that's, that's a, a, a waste of time perhaps, but also if you don't know history, you're doomed to repeat it. So, one of the things that we seek to do in, in managing system is actually sort of instrument the failure points so that you have a feedback loop so that in the future you can avoid repeating failures. Um, and, and that is where metrics come from. So in, in some ways people react against this concept because that boils uh, risk management down to quality control. But really understanding your failure points and, and understanding your performance against some kind of baseline or expected level or tolerance um, is what management is all about. Risk management is quality control. Okay. Well. That's just my opinion. Quality control, but uh, defining the defining the what actual the, yeah, what tolerance the of uh, quality is of oh, yeah. the challenge. All right, and the final place where I want to talk about using models is in operations. This is kind of close to what I do on a daily basis, doing fraud prevention. We actually have a lot of systems in place that evaluate things happening in real time and then make a decision. And that is essentially, uh, and, and that is where you see models incorporated into operations a lot of times. So my, one of my favorite physicists, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future, which is uh, definitely true. Um, so in, in some complex systems, it's very expensive to have the best um, pattern recognition be manual, meaning you can't have humans make every single decision in your system for you. So oftentimes that's why we use technology, right, to automate the actual decisions that we make um, so that our systems can scale and we can offer the level of service that we want to our own organization or to our users. 
So um, this is where we use um, maybe statistically driven models or machine learning, but basically using the computer to um, drive decision making and um, be uh, looking for unusual patterns or outliers. Okay, so in order to actually create um, statistically or, or pure data driven automated models, you actually need to have, uh, you actually need to understand what is normal versus what is an outlier or what is good versus what is bad because then you tune those systems to make that decision. Most of these systems are, are only as smart as we can train them to be. So basically that means that you need to have, you need to be able to sort of define a pattern um, and then uh, analyze a lot of data so that all of the variables that lead up to a pattern or an outlier or a defect can be evaluated in an automated way. Um, and this is, this is really important, uh, I think, in information security, this idea, Donnell Meadows. We don't talk about what we see, we see only what we can talk about. Well, and what that means is, in the language of data is, if you can't define what a bad event is, if, if, at least in retrospect, you have, a, you have no way of really um, you know, magically identifying that pattern in the future. So to be able to define what is good from bad is really important. I work in fraud, so since um, uh, a bad event in fraud means someone loses money, pretty much someone always notices, and so that's a great feedback loop because um, if, if you lose money, you become very attuned to not wanting to lose money. Um, so that's a pattern that you can actually define. Uh, in information security, that's a little more difficult because the feedback loops aren't quite as tight. You can be compromised and not necessarily have a tell that something happened on your system because the data is still there, right? Uh, so in any case, it's if you're if you're going to be using data-driven techniques, you have to be able to um, have the data that you need to sort of tell good from bad. And I'm going to turn this over to Alex now. I think. Yeah. Thanks, Ali. So um, this is interactive the audience time. How many of you guys have actually done something called a risk assessment? You either perform it for a customer, perform it yourself. Great. Um, let's just hear uh, from some of you your favorite risk equations. All right, what risk equations you hate but use anyway? Come on, give it. Good, Patrick. My favorite, because it's easy and valid, is risk equals uh, it's the, it's the annual loss expectancy thing, ALE. Okay. Equals ARO times SLA. Yeah, we're all taught that as part of our CIS yeah, classes, right? Did you know that NIST came up with that in 1979? Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they, they just, we'll, we'll get into the history of this stuff. Anybody else? Come on, Chris, come on. Now. You said favorite. Favorite, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So I'll give, you, I'll give you a little background for me. In uh, about um, 11 years ago now, geez, um, I joined a group of, of really cool penetration testers. They actually, before, had been doing the uh, black box testing for uh, a product that I was PM of. And uh, they said, you know, hey, there's some money in this, let's try it. And so a couple of years after we started doing all these vulnerability assessments and penetration tests, they said, do you know that if you make up risk statements, people will pay more money, right? And so all of a sudden I had to do, I had to, to figure out what this risk stuff means and, and explore this and explore Octave and FRAP and CRAP and all that other stuff, right? And I can promise you that for um, you know the next couple of years, I would go out, I would do these these uh, risk assessments for clients, and I don't think I had one defensible risk statement. Everybody bought them. You know, don't get me wrong, right? Uh, we would argue about whether it's yellow or orange or red or green or whatever it was, right? But at the end of the day, none of them would really stand up to anything that would be considered real scrutiny. It's more of a feeling thing. Um, so I've, I've had this problem for a while now, and I wanted to discuss with you guys something. You know, basically, um, what I've been on in my journey is, is understanding, first, we're looking at risk using this such model. Patrick talked about 
how Alien came out with this and all that stuff. But basically, Dutch wanted more land, but there's this thing called the sea, and the sea happens to have this habit of reclaiming land every so often. So they wanted to figure out why and how and all that stuff. So they created this likelihood of impact statement many, many years ago. You know, it's basically, and, and that's what we've all adopted up to this point. And it's a very engineering and physics sort of background, right? Or economics. Or, or economics, if, if you like to think of it that way. Um, it's been applied and, and, and so forth. Now, this is, this is from uh, my friend Mark Murphy's Security Bullshit um, uh, webcomic that he discontinued. But one of the problems with this, when you do an enterprise risk assessment, is good night. You've got you know, three, four hundred pages of thousands and thousands and thousands of individual point probabilities about every scenario under the sun, right? Um, we actually have a, a, a thing in my group at Verizon. If you use the term "boil the ocean," you get punched in the arm. Um, but you really are just boiling the ocean to try and find some meaning. And you give it to some decision maker, right, who really doesn't want to be doing security in the first place because you're an expense. You say, look, we paid half a million dollars for these 300 pages of imaginary scenarios made up of imaginary numbers. Right? Any, anybody here with your risk assessment statements or just, your, just using CPSS, you, do you know what we're doing as, as uh, an industry? We're, we're, we're really like, if you watch Star Trek and you get off on how they break the laws of physics all the time, yeah, we're the writers for Star Trek. Because everything that I've seen takes ordinal scales and then multiplies them together. We literally take peanut butter times fast and pretend that smells good is, is a process, is, is the outcome. Right? This, this just, is not, that's not how the universe works. Okay? So you get... 300,000 statements of, here's how the universe doesn't work, sorry we made it up. So, one night I had had a little bit to drink, and I went to bed and I had this crazy dream. I'm in, it looked like Miami, and it's a condo thing, a, you know, thing, and, and, I, and I go around the back of the condo, and there's a pool, and there on the lounge is Frederick Hayek, he's surrounded by a couple of gorgeous women, and he says, Alex, Alex, come here, and he dismisses, Bunny and me, and they go off, and I come over and he goes, These point probabilities. And, and I, you know, I'm confused, I don't know what he's, he's saying. But basically, he sits down and he talks to me for a long time. He doesn't give me any answers. Um, you know, he goes off on a couple of tangents about, you know, how Mandelbrot was is always kind of a bummer at parties, and how now Feynman plays the Congos too loud in the apartment next to him, and all that stuff. But he came up with this, which is you take Ali's system. Right? Now you have a whole bunch of other systems. Okay? Because really what we talk about when we talk about risk and risk management is the, if you want to call it entanglement, collision, interaction between multiple complex systems. Worse yet for us in our ability to strive and secure and defend, they're complex adaptive systems. Right? How many times have, have you, with a customer, or has somebody used with you the idea, the, the, the phrase, intelligent adversary? Right? Rings true for just about everybody, right? That's this adaptive bit. Right? And so what Frederick Hayek said a long time ago was, hey, for complex adaptive systems, you just can't make point probabilities. You can only look for patterns. You guys remember Ali talking about patterns, right? So all this to say, you know, basically, we're doing it wrong, okay? We've been doing it wrong, we've known we've been doing it wrong, but yet because our standards and because our certifications and because all of this stuff that, that the in, these, these cottage industries that we've developed as we've blossomed from, you know, doing firewalls and trying to explain packet filters in 1995 um, to now, right? It, we've got this. We've got this bureaucracy, and it, and it has to fail, right? If you like this stuff about complex systems, this is a great. Um, I put this slide in so that you can reference it later. It is a great document. It's very high level. It's three pages of ideas about how complex systems fail, put together by a doctor. Um, and as you read it and you read each premise, I had a handful of slides that come out. 
uh, I, I do encourage you to, if you read each premise, you go, sounds like an IT network, sounds like a network, sounds like a network environment, sounds like a business, okay? Um, it's eerie, okay? Now, one thing I'll tell you about complex systems and trying to apply it is that it's a fairly new discipline. There's one person uh, at Purdue who's written a book, I've called her up in my own time, I'm that much of a dork, um, you know, out of the blue, and you know, basically asked, you know, and, and said, okay, well, what's the proof, what's the test? How do we know for sure that we are what you would call complex adaptive systems? And she said, there is no mathematical certain proof. You know, it was me again trying to engineer something, right, and say, aha, we've got it. Right, so all that we can do is say this seems awfully similar. And if you go to this document, uh, you're going to enjoy that. It's not up anymore. You're going like that. Oh, it was yeah, All right. So the outcome of this is that basically GRC is bankrupt. Tell me what GRC is. Governance, risk, and compliance. If you're not if you're not aware of this, okay. <laughs> governance, for example. What, what, what is governance, right? Some people say, you know, it's what we should be doing, okay? My assertion to you is that governance without metrics and models is superstition. It's you going to some great shaman and him saying, well, you know, you really need to, I, I sliced open this pigeon, I examined the liver, and you really need to go have 18 character passwords, right? That's what it is. Um, risk, I just explained to you that what we do with risk is, is stupid and screwy, right? Compliance, we're always going to have to do this, and I hate it anyway, but that's all right. My point is we need a new approach, right? So if complex systems are described as a process, a collection of system interactions and the human interactions, both our end users, our management, um, uh, and the threat landscape, right? Why, instead of this screwiness where we're multiplying ordinal scales, why don't we look at mm, behavior analytics? Combine that with some data-driven stuff. I call this evidence-based risk management because we're moving away from an engineering and a physics approach to risk towards something that's more like how they do it in medical fields, right? Which is, hey, guess what? Lots of people die if they smoke, so stop smoking if you don't want to die. Right? If you do, well, there's a chance that you'll live, that's great, but you know, there is a strong correlation here. This comes to me through my work at Verizon. Right? And we actually have about 900 failure cases. Uh, and these represent nearly a billion records. This is a, these are actually old. Uh, we've surpassed this at this point. Those are our 2009 numbers represented in the 2010 report. Anybody read the report at all? Uh, a couple of you. For those who don't, what, what we do is we go to our um, uh, our incident response team, and we actually have a questionnaire that we give them, right? We give them training on how to answer the questions and so forth. And so it's really it's sort of uh, Dan here called it epidemiological, but it, it really is a it is a wonderful examination of how incidents and failures happen and, and the characteristics that we put that. To do that, we had to create a framework, a framework that takes that incident narrative, the bad guy did this, did that, did the other thing, and create metrics out of that. That's where we get to threat modeling. So we're sharing our framework now. It's open under what I could get our lawyers to get as close to a Creative Commons license. And you can use it as you wish, please, and we hope you will. There's a wiki that has all the metrics and what they mean and all that stuff. And so the framework has demographics, we collect information about the company, their size, their industry, the size of the security department um, as a shadow metric for you know, kind of their budget. Um, incident classification model, which I'll get to in a second more, but that's an object model that kind of does that narrative, translates it. Um, discovery and mitigation stuff, how long did it take you to get owned, uh, to realize you were owned, you know, how did you realize you were owned, and that sort of thing and an impact model. What's cool about this is the object-oriented event-driven model. So we think of incidents as objects, uh, event objects. And each event object has four A's uh, that we use. It has an agent, an asset, an attribute, and an action. 
And so what we do is, is we say, okay, so agents can be external, and there's metadata underneath all of these, right? Um, well, for example, in, in WebHack, we were using uh, the WASI stuff to describe it. But you take that narrative and you create incident metrics out of it. Right? And then once you gather enough, you've got an actual data set. Right? And I think this is important because a lot of people who want to throw away risk say, well, just tell me stories. Right? Give me an anecdote. I want to take anecdotal evidence. I want to go to management and say, this happened over here. Don't let it happen here. Well, that's really cherry picking out of your sample. right? Once a neighbor of mine dated Cindy Crawford. That doesn't mean I'm going to date Cindy Crawford. right? So what you end up with out of this is behaviors. This is our current data set. Um, that and, and these are the action types that you see along, and this is trends from 2005 to 2000, 2009. And what's awesome is that spike in malware at 2008 in the use of malware, that corresponds to another spike in the use of custom malware. And so all of this stuff is in that report that you can look at, that you can utilize the data set yourself. It's freely available. We don't even make you register. We fought with marketing to get that privilege. Um, but that gives us these understanding these behaviors, and that's just one metric that we have, right? That gives us the potential for pattern matching. And good Lord of the dance, right? We might be able to do patterns, remember how I talked about patterns, right? And use them in models that is real risk management, something that's operationally proficient. Those of you who run a, a security department or risk team, how many times does your risk analyst picked up a piece of paper, run down to the sock going, there's a 20% chance the mail service can get going, quick, quick, you know. That doesn't happen. It's just not applicable. There's a disconnect. And we're hoping to bridge that. We're hoping to bridge that. I want to show you how to create a threat slash risk model using Veris today. This is uh, something that, um, you know, Allison has, has had developed. Um, and what I want to do is take her narrative and talk about it in various form. So, do you want to introduce the? Yeah, sure. Slide? So this is a, this is essentially a a model that uh, a system sort of model that I, I built when I was trying to map out different ways to commit fraud. So this is the fraud slide. If any of you have questions about fraud, like ask it before we move off the slide. Uh, so what I initially started doing is I was doing a threat tree diagram. I don't know if any of you remember Schneier's paper from 1999, but he basically took like an Ishikawa decision tree type thing and he was trying to map it out. And he was actually, um, one of the things that was interesting about that was I was trying to figure out if there was a way that you could actually enmesh probabilities in that. But I thought, okay, well, I'll take this as an approach and I started mapping it out. But then what I realized actually is that the, the the threats, there was, there was sort of a, a, a pattern, there was a progression, right? Like, a, you know, getting root, right? Progression. But, um, so there was a progression, and the attacks, or the, um, the threats actually clustered. So instead of actually having a threat tree diagram, it was kind of like, a, it was more like, a, well, first you do something like this, in this class of threat, and then you do this, and then you do this. So the thing that, I, uh, that was interesting about this to me is that this, this is kind of how they clustered. There was some kind of what you would think of as a technical exploit or technical attack that took advantage of some kind of vulnerability in either software or, um, you know, a person's ability, you know, person making choices, like, you know, uh, falling for a social engineering type attack. And then there was some kind of, um, of theft that happened of, of some kind of credentials. And then, and then there was use of the credentials in order to get money out of the system in some way. And so just uh, I, I just pulled a couple different things from different classes so you can kind of get a sense of what I mean. So, you know, pretty typical is that people will send out spam and, and they will be phishing attacks in order to trick someone uh, into clicking on a link. The link doesn't really show where it goes. It's sort of obfuscated. Either it looks, it's got control characters in it so that it looks like it's going to your bank, for example, or maybe they just use something like tiny URL so that the customer or the person doesn't actually know what they're clicking on. 
Um, and then when they click on it, you know, it could be um, malware at the other end, or maybe they actually download something and execute something, or maybe they actually just fall for the phishing attack. And that, and that is like the technical exploit piece of it. But then there's, there's someone on the other end who's actually harvesting all of this and they're pulling all of the information. And then they impersonate the victim in some way. But then that's also not the end of it because ultimately these, this, this attack is purposeful, right? This, this person wants to make money. So that it's, it's one thing to sort of set up malware and fish people and have all these credentials. You can have files full of stolen credit card information and what have you. But eventually you want to get money out of the system. And so to, the last step, of course, is monetization, extracting value back out of the system. And uh, that, is, you know, that is done by either um, like moving cash in some way or by getting goods that can be, then be converted into some other form of value. Does anyone have questions about this? Yeah, Chris has a question. Does corporate intelligence play into that or is it something outside of that? I beg your pardon? Does corporate intelligence play into that or is it something outside of that? I would say, uh, oh, I would say that's a different type of fraud. I'm actually here talking about more like, you know, just stealing money, sure. using stolen uh, financial instruments and such. Absolutely, corporate right. espionage would be totally, totally different chain, I would cool. expect. Although some of the steps might be familiar, right? They may cluster in, in similar ways. So, by the way, one of the reasons why this is sort of useful is because um, for me on my system, there's only so many things that I can control, right? I work for a financial institution, and so where, where, where we are is we're the point of monetization. So all of these other things that have happened to victims or customers or people or computers happen off my platform. So what am I supposed to do about it? Um, well, that's sort of one way to think about it. What am I supposed to do about it? Another is that this actually, knowing how this sort of chain works, helps us make investment decisions about how we're, where we're going to put our sort of risk management dollars, right? So we actually have some outbound activities to do things like try and prevent phishing attacks on our customer base because we understand that it's like a big funnel, like there's a lot of stuff happening up here at the top off of our platform, and then you know it gets filtered as a, a systems or people get victimized until it comes onto our system, and then we have a chance to prevent monetization when a transaction happens, right? So anyway, so this is, this is kind of how I've diagrammed out uh, fraud as it manifests on our system and, and where the, the source of those attacks and how those attacks happen. And this is our, one of my threat diagrams. So I thought this was awesome because this part actually mirrors something that we've got in our data set. Um, one of the things that happened this year, uh, or the past, I guess, 18 months, was we work with the United States Secret Service uh, because they do a lot of incident response uh, for corporations and so forth. Uh, and so that the 900 uh, cases that are represented in that data breach report, they are all now in various models. Um, so we actually have a data set now represented in these object models. That is both the Verizon Incident Response Team stuff, it's the United States Secret Service stuff. It's, um, it's very unique in, in its size and it's about to be opened and, and, and uh, given out to the public. Um, but these actually corresponded to stuff that we have in the data set. Um, so I thought for Threat Mom Live, what we walk through is just basically great. Here's how we describe this in Veris, and here's what that, how we can use this information and why classification actually has a purpose and meaning in life. So, we see three events, Veris events. In addition, we can describe four separate fraud events. So, we have a seven object model. All right, and the first, we'll use those four A's from Veris to describe it. Um, in ours, it was, um, we had an agent that was external organized crime from Eastern Europe. What did they do? Well, the action was a social attack. The type was phishing. The channel was email. The target was an end user. Right? The asset was human type end, end user. And the attribute was integrity. One of the things that you'll note with the attribute section is that unless it's an availability event, you actually get integrity, 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 and then you get confidentiality if you think of it, if you want to think of it that way. 
Um, it just kind of happens that way. We actually tried using Don Parker's uh, hex app for security attributes, and we've implemented that. Um, so you can get a little more granular with it if you'd like. So that you're using actual data from your data set. This, yeah, this part is, um, when we hit the fraud part, it's obviously not, because that doesn't exist. Um, and we're going to be describing an end user, yours describes a PayPal end user, this actually describes a, an internal end user of the, uh, asset. So, a little different, but I felt there was enough similarities that we could go to this. So the second one, right, was uh, um, was the actual malware now from the drive-by. Um, you had a type of install additional malware, desktop. Now we don't collect a whole lot of metadata. Um, for example, we don't collect operating system. Um, as we do it, it's just enough to collect the data set at the level that we do. You can obviously extend Veris out. I'd love to see time frame between events as metadata that we just don't do right now. Many times it's hard for the IR team to piece that stuff together and so forth. Um, but basically, this is, this is our second object here. Um, as it's described, third object um, is an actual other malware event that we call, yeah. Just checking the last one. Uh, this is assessed post confidence. The, yeah, all of our stuff is post compromise. So I'm not just in my head trying to figure out the modeling mechanism for, you know, the, I guess, premonition. I'm right? like trying to understand how the modeling mechanism plays into future pieces if you can't identify agent in action. Fair with me. Cool. All right. Um, let's get through this as an example, and then you'll see. I'll, I'll actually, there is wonderful real-world example of, of what you're looking at. So um, here's our last one, which is you know one piece of malware, second piece of malware. Sometimes it's the same malware. That's fine. We break that out into two different objects because uh, for obvious classification reasons. Um, and then we hit the fraud. And these are basic, you know, just, I've created fraud objects here that are very similar to what Allison described in the previous slide. I'm um, still using, assuming that there is no mule, there's no other interaction, there's no handoff, it's just one agent throughout this. Um, in the Secret Service data set, for example, there was a whole lot of internal partnering with external. Uh, there's a wonderful slide where we show um, percentages of external agents, internal agents, and partner, business partner agents, and they all add up to more than 100%, and everybody freaks out about that, even though there's like something that says there, and we need to put it in big red letters or something. They add up to more than 100% because people collaborate. Internal agents will collaborate with external agents. You know, partners will get involved through internal agents, uh, and so forth. Um, or, or external agents, excuse me. So anyway, that's uh, a little bit about that. What's great is we can use the model to understand you know, the points at, at which we could have applied better controls. Um, right now, when we do it with the variety, oh yeah, please. From 4 to 7, why haven't you considered any asset of impact? Oh, from 4 to 7, because these are, these are fraud events, and you certainly could, but Alice and I have had time to extend where it's out to include it. Because in my mind, asset in that case would be a digital asset. As in what? A digital asset. Mm. Digital asset. Right? You, you're trying to steal the credentials and do something with the person's account mm -hmm. by buying certain things. And the impact, you can, as you already mentioned, the impact would be whatever confidential. Right, right. Uh, you, you, can, you can, yeah, you can make arguments. Um, it, this seems really deceptively easy. Uh, spending months and months in a little white room in Ashburn, Virginia, with no view, with a whiteboard, you know, having logic debates is fun for about like the first three hours, and then the next three months is like agonizing. You want to stab your eyes out. So to extend this out into fraud would mean Allison would hate me after about oh I don't know twenty minutes, um, which I'm you know I'm just not going to go there. Um, but yeah, you, I think you can extend this out if you like. I think you're going to see differences. Um, uh, maybe the A4 model doesn't apply. Ten minutes, great. Okay, so 
Uh, one thing that we do is we actually have the IR team guys come in and give a post assessment and they give qualitative, sub highly subjective descriptions about what could have fixed stuff and so forth. But what's awesome is you can actually take these, especially if you've got a great data set, and you can say, well, gee, you know, we could have had additional controls of different events in the object chain, right? The end user could have made some better choices. Don't click on the stupid link, right? Um, what if the end user had a DLP that said, hey, you really are sending your credentials out. Are you sure that you want to do that? Um, or in this case, uh, I, I said end user DLP here, but in R, in the example I drew this from, it was a corporate example. They did not have primary tuned DLP. They just had it in place and weren't even watching it because it was a compliance thing, right? Um, uh, so the, the NCUA said, put it in, right? That was um, like a compliance thing, they just had to have it installed, and they didn't have to be watching it? Yes, yeah, like IDS, right? I was surprised. What's that? I was surprised. Yeah. I was surprised. Right? And, and additionally, right, we see this all the time, right? When I went to go buy an iPad, um, like that morning, I'm that big of a dork, yes, that's fine, make fun of me. But that morning, I'm on there, I'm waiting to buy it, right, and it's coming on, and my transaction gets declined. I'm like, what? Right? And my transaction just gets declined. So I call freaking Wachovia and I'm like, why is my transaction declined? There's lots of money in the account. What's going on? And it turns out that my wife, who's got a completely different credit card number, had bought magic markers at the exact instant or within some time frame that I was trying to buy my iPad. And so they flagged me. I couldn't get my iPad uh, immediately. Um, I was pretty ticked off about it, but after I calmed down, right, you don't really need an iPad even though I bought one. Um, and after I calmed down a bit, I was happy that they had anti-fraud mechanisms in place. And I think if I got jacked here in Barcelona, I'd be really thrilled about the anti-fraud mechanisms in place. Yes, there are false positives with that too, but they actually work sometimes. So we can, we can also start applying things and objects on the fraud side, I think. So, that said, we talked about patterns and pattern matching. You actually get a potential here to understand. If we see events one, two, and three happening over and over again in certain various models, right? we can say, what can we apply at the next object? In this case, it's four twice and five once. We don't really care if they're out of alphanumeric sequence, as I show here. We can apply something there, right? Good night, we can even store these in a database. And this is where, um, Chris, to answer your question, we can restore these in a database. They can be stored later to prevent, detect, and respond. Actually, I think it's detect, uh, respond, and then prevent, but that's neither here nor there, right? And so what you do is, if you, what if you hook up your database to all of these wonderful systems that you have? And you start marrying these patterns that you know are representative of the failure. Now, before you think that this is really academic and who's going to do this, um, they're not using Verish per se. They've borrowed some stuff. They've borrowed a little fair stuff, Patrick. But there is a large, large regional bank who has a ginormous VI instance who's defeating Zeus because he's looking at system behaviors, sucking it into a VI instance, and then spawning anti-fraud processes out. Okay? He's actually going to be, I forget what, he's, he's out like 50 terabytes of information now. He's going to bump up to over 100 uh, terabytes of, of storage and move to Hadoop install and all sorts of fantastic stuff with CSO is. But he's actually just justified the expenditures as a bank, right? Because their small businesses aren't like finding all their cash on and going out of business. They're not losing these customers. So, can I? Yeah. I'm not sure if that totally answers Chris's question. It does answer. Okay, okay so, so, so let me go ahead. No, uh, my my question is, is uh, how are you able to even put a classification mechanism on it if it's not identified? If it's not identified at all. So, so if you, if you, if you, if you, if you, okay, if you, if you can't preempt uh, the intent, right? Because intent is kind of part of that action piece of, is it a fraud event or not? If, if you can't anticipate that intent and you can't understand that the agent 
of that intent is malware or a conversation or physical theft. How does that allow you to identify things in the environment that are occurring? So, just, just in general. Well, let me, let me take a shot so, at that. Let me, yeah, let me take a shot at that. So, so what, what you were showing around the sort of classification, uh, the post compromise um, analysis of the, thank you, Marissa, analysis of the data is, um, is, is sort of the first, is the first step. You have to basically mine the data in order to um, figure out which variables would be indicative of intent. So um, in my world, it's about identity and intent. And so we have, we have all of this data and that's what I was talking about before. You sort of have to know good from bad because you have to know, you have to at least have the bad event uh, instrumented. And then um, you, can, you can essentially do math to figure out to what, what variables would be predictive that the intent or the event that's about to happen is going to be bad. And then uh, within your system, if you have the system, it, it's instrumented is about collecting the metrics, but you also need to have it um, decisionable, right? So in the in, in case of transactions, um, every transaction that you know you do when you run a credit card through is scored. There's a model running there that has all of these variables and. When Alex was buying something at the same time that his wife was buying something, you know, some 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 switch flipped. There was something that happened. Maybe the transactions were too close together. Maybe the fact that it was a five dollar transaction, which looks like a test transaction, followed by how much do I have to ask? Anyway, that I have, I have a cleaner answer. Okay. If I can. Sorry. Let me. Seriously? Yeah, I do. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's just to say that. Um, I took these. I took the slides out in the, in the sake of time, but you can pattern match over here. What we've done in the impact modeling is, if you're familiar with ISO 27005 or FAIR, they have in, um, impact classification. So there's certain buckets, and you can use activity-based cost accounting and so forth to, to figure out how you put money in buckets. And some of them, I don't believe you can. Reputation and so forth. But if you collect enough impacts associated with events, right? Then you can start talking about uh, layering, possibly, an intent model on top of it. So you know what? We're seeing a lot of reputation damage. There's probably decent intent. And look, there is, we can actually match some of these impact models where we're seeing reputation as a significant um, uh, portion of the loss model to certain options here. Now, that gives us an opportunity at some event within that A4 piece to uh, start applying some detective or responsive control that hopefully will do it. I'm not saying Veris will eliminate it. I'm not saying that it's even great as a predictive analytical model. I think you can build analytical models on it. I'm saying you can do this now and you can apply it. So, so uh, it, it sets the you need to go do work flag. Yeah. Well, it sets the. It doesn't give you any more than that, which, which I can't ask for much more than that, but, but it at least gives you. Right, and some of it can be automated. The you need to go do work flag, this guy's dealing with Zeus, right? That's actually, you know, no. We're, we see this pattern, ACH transfer does not happen. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's fairly automated work for him. Sure. Somebody at the end of the day has to say, oh, look, we flagged these five. Cool. Okay. So that's how I would do it, looking for intent. What I like is when we have so many of these models in place, we can start distilling this data. And that's what I think is, is more important. How is that cleaner? Uh, it's fine. <laughs> um, you've got gazillions of data. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. You've got 900 cases. Got what? 900? Yeah. Those are 900 patterns, right? You have 900 million records, is that what you said? There were 900 million, yeah, that's, that's the actual, that's like credit card, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, that's, all right. Further, the data you've got are the people who hired you and the people who hired you. Yeah. 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 The data you've got are the people who hired you, right? Mm -hmm. And probably those are big companies because I think you're expensive. Actually, you, if you want to download it on your iPad and see the distribution because all right. they're well, back all the yeah. So, yeah. so come back to eBay. You know, you have pretty much a random view of it. And, and so you can, I mean, these transactions range in value all over the map, right? Yeah. 
Okay, just leave it. So where I'm really going is sampling bias, uh, bias to external validity. How do I know that because you can match your patterns to hers, that that's real? I'm not talking about she's got, I would really believe, because it's drawn from such a huge uh, flow of data. Right, and to be fair, what I have are my transactions, right? I don't have, I don't have, uh, I don't necessarily have data from my peers, let's just say. I don't have, I don't have, I can't cross correlate across all of those different systems. So, uh, there, are, there are statistical methods for, for pulling out things like, those, those biases, right? Well, maybe. And, I mean, yeah, and methods, whether you believe them or not. When the financial institutions start up, they often will, you know, they will have higher fraud rates than after they have a certain amount of data. I mean, there's like a critical mass of data in order to be able to sort of do the statistical modeling on top of that. So. All right, so we're getting to wrap it up. So yeah. we'll just, just to finish, um, we're actually incorporating other stuff and if you think our 900 as far as we've been able to tell is actually pretty significant now uh, that doesn't say i'm not saying that it's without bias there's lots of bias we say that pretty much up front yeah um but i'm not so sure as i look at the actual uh, uh, event models that those represent bias because what you're talking about in terms of of you have to separate. You're making an inference that impact and we'll call it like the, the uh, impact model and the event model are uh, they are only informative when linked. Well, I guess what I'm saying is I think you can break out because methods and intelligent attackers and that sort of thing. They uh, it doesn't matter if you for a healthcare record or IP or whatever. That that you know, that intent. Anyway, that's so, I think you can do that and not worry about this, this sample bias as much. So, and, and also, I would say that yes, I have a lot more data, but I'm also trying to build um, operational models that are going to automate decision making. But a model, just uh, in the abstract, a model is something that you can use to make your system more predictable. And I think that the amount of data that Alex has and using the, the, and using the framework that they've created is something that can that can help people make decisions and make their systems more predictable. Maybe not as predictable as mine on a transaction level basis, understanding the probability that the transaction is going to be fraud, but to make it more predictable. Keep waving your hands, Marissa. People, you know, people know. We're good. Thank you very much.